Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with award-winning author and historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. Here now on Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history by the stories we learn. John J. Dwyer, four parts on the Civil War. What's this one? Tell me the story. Well, hopefully to take an entire month of Oklahoma goals, that signals that we think this is a pretty, not just important, but fascinating topic for us to explore through. And, and indeed, it is the Civil War in Indian Territory. Who knew that the Civil War raged across wide expanses of modern-day Oklahoma back in the 1860s. I probably wasn't paying attention when it was taught, but indeed, it raged right here in Oklahoma, as in skirmishes, battles, campaigns, famous warriors, strategic designs by both sides in the war. I would just say to you who are listening that if you didn't know that, don't feel like the Lone Ranger. It wasn't that long ago, and here I am writing history books about Oklahoma that I actually had a clue of what was going on. Would I be putting you on the spot, Gwen, if I asked uh, your recollections of this period in history? Well, you've already piqued my interest with famous warriors. I never knew about famous warriors in the Civil War. That's right, and not just in Virginia or Pennsylvania, but but here in modern-day Oklahoma— And yet, despite most of our dearth of knowledge on this topic, the war between the states was the bloodiest and most destructive epic proportionally of any event ever in our state, in the territory before it. It killed a higher percentage of citizens than any other event in our history. It spanned four years and shook the life of every person in the region and affected their destiny and those of their descendants for generations to come many to this day. This was particularly so for the Indian Territory tribes who comprised the vast majority of the future state's population during the the War of 1861 to 65. These included, of course, the five great Indian republics, those that were traditionally referred to as the five civilized tribes, the Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Creeks, and Seminoles. And we're going to do this step-by-step, Gwen, through these next four programs to make it both more understandable and more interesting to those many of us who aren't that familiar with it. And we're going to weave it together with the singularly fascinating histories of Oklahoma and its native tribes that made the war in Indian Territory unique to any other theater of this massive conflict. And by the way, those of you that want to know more about the epic struggle that roared across modern-day Oklahoma during the four-year American Civil War, we have a treasury of resources for you. Books like The War Between the States, America's Uncivil War, the one volume with more than 500 illustrations that tells you the entire story of America's epic war with itself. Then we have nearly 40 pages about it in our Oklahoma history book, The Oklahomans, Volume 1. My historical novels, Stonewall and Robert E. Lee, and then numerous free, as you've talked about many times on the program, Gwen, numerous free podcasts, audios, PowerPoint slideshows, and articles I've done about the Civil War, including in Oklahoma. You can find all of these at our johnjdwyer.com website. And again, aside from the books, everything on there, hundreds of pages of material and electronic files are free for you. Well, Gwen, America's greatest tragedy exploded into war on April 12, 1861, at Fort Sumter, a federal outpost in the Atlantic Ocean Harbor at Charleston, South Carolina, as the greatest armies ever to assemble in the Western Hemisphere crashed together across the eastern half of North America and on the sea surrounding it, Indian Territory, which comprised all of modern-day Oklahoma except for the Panhandle, remained a sparsely populated enclave. We're talking those five Indian republics constituted most of the population of 75, maybe 80,000 people total. That's an average, by the way, of about one person per square mile. 
Other tribes, though, had come, retreated, fought, or invaded their way here. Many of these were nomadic or semi-nomadic plains tribes, notably among them the Comanches, the fearsome lords of the plains, perhaps the greatest horse soldiers in history, who had violently run other tribes out of modern-day western Oklahoma or subjugated them. So it's a shock to most people to learn, Gwen, that before white-dominated American settlement pioneered the West, the Oklahoma country and the North American continent was not one sprawling utopian paradise. It's a shock to learn that it was a blood-drenched land of danger and seemingly capricious violence. The tribes fought each other every step of the way. Not one foot of those Comanches' vast Southern Plains empire had they not fought, won, and taken from other tribes, including the Apaches, most of whom they drove far south to Mexico or west to Arizona. The Cherokees, meanwhile, slaughtered the Osage men, women, and children at the Battle of Claremore Mound. The Osages, in turn, slaughtered Kiowa women and children at Cutthroat Gap in southwest Oklahoma. The Tonkawas roasted and ate parts of the bodies of dead Comanches and others they killed in battle. You heard that right. And many tribes combined to nearly, in turn, wipe out the Tonkawas near Fort Cobb. These were backstories of why the old Civil War in Oklahoma was not a typical campaign of that conflict. Most of it across America, in fact, was not technically a civil war. The great African-American economist Walter Williams wrote several years ago that the war between the states was no more a civil war between the United States and the Confederate States than the American War of Independence from Britain was. A civil war involves two or more factions fighting for control of a government. Williams explained that the Confederacy was no more trying to take over the American government in Washington than George Washington and the Patriots were trying to overthrow the crown in London in the 1770s and 80s. Both the Confederates and the colonists were trying to get away, to secede, to declare their independence. The American Civil War in Indian Territory, however, modern-day Oklahoma, in every way and on every level, was a fight for supremacy, a desperate one, not just from an American government standpoint, but from a tribal standpoint. There were existing rivalries and fights going on within the tribes that extended back for generations and reignited with the eruption of the war. And after the break, we're going to backpedal into, through some of those to see how that really set the stage for a unique theater of the Civil War in Indian Territory. You said five civilized tribes. Where did that expression civilized come from? Sure. Well, that was to denote the tribes that had advanced past others in their embrace of Western civilization, the technology, the education, the reading and the writing, the Christian religion. Many of those uh, medicine and hospitals ability to lengthen the uh, life or reduce infant mortality. So that was what that traditional term referred to. The Golden Nugget when we return. This is Oklahoma Gold. John J. Dwyer telling of America's uncivil war, the role of the Native Republics, the U.S. leaders, and the strife all in Indian territory we know as Oklahoma. If you want to know more, there's a great book, The Oklahomans, Volume 1, Ancient to Statehood. And as he said, it outlines the Civil War in great detail. You can order it now at johnjdwyer.com and see for yourself how he takes on all peoples and all aspects of the Civil War. It is quite fascinating. The golden nugget of this part one of four chapters of Oklahoma Gold when we return. You're listening to 1000 KTOK. I'm Gwen Falconer Lippert. News Radio 1000 KTOK. I'm Gwen Falconer Lippert. This is Oklahoma Gold. And tonight we are learning more about Indian Territory, the Native Republics, and life in the land of America's uncivil war. Yes, our land was key to the victories and defeats of that war. Here's John J. Dwyer with the conclusion of part one of four 
about the Civil War and Indian Territory on tonight's Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history through the stories that amaze us, John J. Dwyer, it was a fight for supremacy, the Civil War, but you're talking about tribal nations. That's right, Gwen, in Indian Territory, modern-day Oklahoma, the Civil War truly was a fight between brother against brother. And we're going to look in this segment leading up to the Golden Nugget, the first of four episodes on the Civil War in Indian Territory, just why there were such serious divisions within the great native republics of Indian Territory when the war between the states erupted. In other words, they were already there. There was already an undercurrent of past events that had left an unsettled atmosphere. There were great disagreements, for instance, in tribes like the Cherokees and the Creeks regarding whether they should or should not come west back in the 1830s, before and after, when the U.S. government sought to forcibly remove them from the American Southeast. As we've discussed in other Oklahoma Gold episodes, significant factions of these tribes, including some of their best and brightest leaders, had reluctantly concluded that if they did not leave for Indian Territory from Georgia, North Carolina, Alabama, and so forth, they would be ruined. Brilliant Cherokees such as Elias Boudinot, Major Ridge, and Stan Wadey, for instance, perceived that a virtual genocide was being unleashed, even if unwittingly, on the Cherokee Nation in Georgia and thereabouts. Also, that the land in Indian Territory was fertile and promising, along with the millions of dollars in cash and annual annuities the government promised them if they went west. There is a gold rush, these Cherokee leaders exclaimed. People are overrunning our land and stealing it from us. That included, by the way, Cherokee principal chief or president John Ross's own property. Whiskey peddlers are bringing our people down, these leaders cried, and they're corrupting their morals by bringing oceans of alcohol to them, even though it's illegal to do so. All that was true. Creek factions, meanwhile, had bristled at one another for at least half a century, back to when they fought against each other. The upper and the lower creeks on opposite sides of the Black Hawk Indian War and War of 1812 between the U.S. and the British Empire. Well, enmity exploded between minority factions in some of these tribes and the majorities who were determined to outlast successive U.S. presidential administrations and stay on their land during that period in the 1830s of Indian removal. The minority factions, those that were ready to move for the greater good of the tribe, were sadly proven correct as the government finally forced the tribes west along their trails of tears. The fact that some of their tribal opponents left earlier, those that saw the good in doing that, the reluctant good, and did not experience such suffering as occurred on the trails of tears, however, along with accusations of those leaders betraying their tribes, led to the, depending on your perspective on the matter, executions or murders of several of the brightest leaders of the minority factions of some of these tribes that had advocated moving west. The Seminoles, meanwhile, experienced, you remember that was one of the five native republics, uh, came out of Florida, had had seceded themselves from the larger Creek tribe some years before. They experienced their own great drama in the pre-war years. It took them most of the 1840s and 50s to get to Indian Territory from Florida and Georgia, during which time they fought four bloody wars against the U.S. government. The fact that these issues, Gwen, still ignite controversy within some of the tribes nearly two centuries later illustrates how very important they were back in 1861. And so, on the eve of war, the Confederate States of America across the American South had come into existence and seceded from the Union. Both the Confederacy and the United States recognized there was a large region of land, peopled to the extent that it was by the tribes, Indian Territory, and that it was important to their own war efforts. They both envisioned Indian Territory as a breadbasket, similar to the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, where they could harvest the vast agricultural crops and utilize the large supply of stock animals and poultry to feed their troops, not just in the west, but farther east as well. The South, facing a colossal manufacturing disadvantage to a North whose white population 
outnumbered the South's own four and a half to one, hoped to secure enough lead from Indian Territory mines to supply all the ordnance its soldiers and sailors would need. Northern Federals, meanwhile, viewed Indian Territory as the perfect launching stage for a backdoor invasion and conquest of Confederate Texas, which might allow Union forces to trap the Confederate armies in an early stage in the war in a pincers movement from the West and meeting up with Union armies coming from the East. Conversely, the South intended Indian Territory to serve as a buffer zone against federal invasion of Texas. Well, how all of this involved, of course, depended on one very important factor. Which side would the Indian Territory tribes support? Well, the North, of course, right? Well, you'll have to listen next time to find that out. That makes me think it's not a given. (laughs) But can you imagine that the Indian Territory was so valuable for so many different reasons? When we think of the Civil War as just the North and the South, and yet the drama continued out there in western Oklahoma before we were a state. Are we surprised that once again, the fact that New York textbook publishers didn't write that all this happened doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just meant that they didn't think it was important or likely didn't even know it. Now that's Oklahoma Gold. Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with award-winning author and historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. Here now, on Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history by the new stories from the old? John J. Dwyer, we're talking about the Civil War and Indian Territory. Part one was tribal history. Part two Who did the tribes choose to side with? That's right, Gwen. Uh, In our previous episode, the first, as you referenced, of four parts of the Civil War in Indian Territory, we discussed how by the eve of the war between the states in 1861, the vast majority of the population of probably tops 80,000 in modern-day Oklahoma were indigenous people who had come here on the Trails of Tears or from the north and the west to find new lands to hunt, which sometimes involved conquest of other tribes' lands, and that some of the tribes had histories of serious division already within their own ranks. We teased the question last time, Gwen, of which side the Oklahoma tribes sided with in the war. So, Gwen, I'm going to introduce a name now, Albert Pike, forgotten to history largely, but key in this whole sequence of events. He was a highly accomplished man even before the war, a Massachusetts native, a U.S. government representative. But for various reasons, he sided with the Southern Confederacy, not the Northern Union. This proved a fateful decision for everybody, not just Albert Pike. He began to appeal in person, on their own grounds, their own lands, one by one, to those five Indian republics residing in Eastern and Southern Indian Territory, the Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Creeks, and Seminoles, appeal to them to side with the Confederacy. He also traveled out west to meet with the rough-hewn Plains tribes of western Oklahoma, the Comanches, Kiowas, southern Cheyennes, and Arapahoes. His efforts bore historic fruit for the South. The Indian Republics, or five civilized tribes, allied themselves with the Confederacy. The Plainsmen, meanwhile, though they avoided an official alliance, pledged their neutrality in the war. This was key because it also meant they pledged to end their threatening and even raiding of those southeastern tribes, particularly the Chickasaws, as they had been doing. So once again, Gwen, the soundbite, TED Talk approach, while it has its place, as far as American history, it falls way short. How many of us knew that 
all these intra- and inter-tribal conflicts and wars that we've already mentioned, that the Comanches, Kiowas, and Cheyennes viewed the Chickasaws, Seminoles, and others as traitors and enemies on their own Southern Plains domain. The celebrated part Choctaw Oklahoma artist Neil Taylor of Durant's dramatic painting, Distant Relatives, depicts this bitter tension in an illustration, a painting in Chapter 4 of our book, Oklahomans, Volume 1. Well, the great southeastern tribes didn't side with the South just because they liked Albert Pike's looks or how he dressed. They did so because of what the Confederacy, through him, offered them. In addition to protection of their rights and independence in their Indian Territory lands, something the United States had never done, representative seats in the Confederate Congress in Richmond. This did not initially include congressional voting rights, though it eventually would, but it did include the right to propose legislation, to serve on committees, and to speak during congressional sessions. The Confederates also conferred to the Native Republics a sweeping slate of enhanced civil rights in the courts. These included those related to their personal property, especially in relation to whites. They also established Confederate district courts, something the lack of which the tribes had loudly protested for decades, but which the United States had not yet allowed. The closest such court for the U.S. had previously been in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Now the Confederates established them in the Cherokee country of Northern Indian Territory in the Choctaw domain of Southern Indian Territory. This allowed the tribes to have much more influence in the judiciary of their own people and the justice dispensed for them. Thus, though siding with the Confederacy was not unanimous among the members of the tribes, though it was close to that with some, including the Choctaws and Chickasaws, the majority of the people did support it. And by the way, it also wasn't because the tribes wanted to keep their slaves that they sided with the South. Oh, wait a minute. The tribes had slaves? I'll never forget one of the many bright students I taught during my 16 years teaching history and ethics at Southern Nazarene University, an African-American woman who stared at me incredulously upon learning that the tribes owned their own slaves and declared, wait a minute, professor, and I'm quoting her now, you're telling me I've always been supposed to feel sorry for the Indians, and now I find out they own my ancestors? End quote. Well, that's right. The Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Creeks, and Seminoles all own black slaves from their long centuries in the American Southeast. And in another surprise to most of us, Gwen, many of those slaves in the South had been sold there from northern owners who realized the geography, climate, and growing seasons of the North did not make chattel slavery profitable. That was one of the many reasons Southerners scorned the Union's violent invasion of them in 1861 as being economically rather than morally motivated. I should add happily that, as often it does, the more complex yet infinitely fascinating history that really happened, rather than the simplistic one-dimensional version so often taught in the 21st century, provided a joyful resolution for my sharp SNU student. She learned that she herself had Creek ancestors only three or four generations back. She was filled with pride upon learning that she had forefathers and mothers of both Native and African origin to learn about and treasure, and that they were all Americans now. How about that? That's amazing. That is amazing. Indeed, one of the themes running throughout this four-part series, The Civil War in Indian Territory, Modern Oklahoma, is that a lot of people had a lot of different reasons for fighting. Certainly, Slavery was crucial for many people, but for many others, it wasn't. Another brain buster for folks is learning that one-third of the states where slavery was legal during the war between the states sided with the North. You say, well, what were those states? Well, glad you asked. Maryland, Delaware, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Missouri. Tobacco states? So they were called the border states? Yeah. And that was because... The borderline between what became the Confederacy and the United States, but also on the borderline of where slavery was economically profitable. All the people that could be told to get rid of their slaves were not told. So the border states actually got to keep their slaves. And the cherry on the Sunday, Gwen, Washington, D.C., the capital of the Federal Union, still had public slave auctions into the second year of the war. 
Now that's Washington, D.C. gold. The golden nugget when we returned. This is Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history by the new lessons we learn. John J. Dwyer, you said there were a lot of different reasons for the fight. What were they? Right. Wait a minute. He just said the, the Oklahoma tribe sided with the South. Well, yeah, largely so. And though there was an abolitionist minority faction within the Indian Territory tribes of modern-day eastern Oklahoma, Gwen, it was a minority faction. Natives who favored the North, including those who would eventually switch from supporting the South to the North, why they owned slaves just as those did who fought for the South. The Cherokee leaders on both sides were slave owners. They weren't fighting over slavery. Let's look at what the Cherokees wrote in their own words were their reasons for siding with the Confederacy in 1861. They made clear their intention with the title of their declaration. And keep in mind, Gwen, this was in a time when folks preferred titles to be long and rolling rather than brief and pithy. Here's the title of their declaration. Quote, Declaration by the people of the Cherokee Nation of the causes which have impelled them to unite their fortunes with those of the Confederate States of America. End quote. And it began, the Cherokees' reasons for breaking with the Union and siding with the Confederacy, quote, Providence rules the destinies of nations and events by inexorable necessity, overrule human resolutions. In the states which still adhered to or stayed with the Union, a military despotism has displaced the civil power and the laws became silent amid arms, end quote. Now, Gwen, here they were thinking of, they very well knew what was going on elsewhere in states like Maryland with what had happened in Baltimore or Missouri in St. Louis where troops had shot down civilians in armed confrontations in the streets of the cities, as well as the legislature in Maryland, which had been jailed when it indicated its desire to secede from the Union. The Cherokee uh, Declaration continues, I quote again, Free speech and almost free thought became a crime. The mandate of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was set at naught by the military power. And this outrage on common right, approved by a president... They were talking about Abraham Lincoln, sworn to support the Constitution, end quote. So that was what, not John Dwyer, that was what the Cherokees thought. The Choctaws, Chickasaws, and others had variations on that. All five Native republics sided with the Confederacy. Meanwhile, Albert Pike, that New England Confederate, also traveled to Western Indian Territory to meet with the nomadic warrior tribes of the Southern Plains, the Comanches, Kiowas, Southern Cheyenne, and the Arapahoes. He managed to persuade them to follow a course of neutrality in the war. And as we alluded to in the first episode, this included their agreement to not continue threatening, jeopardizing, and sometimes attacking the so-called civilized tribes, such as the Chickasaws, Creeks, and Seminoles, all of whose lands stretched out into the plains country of modern-day western Oklahoma. And Gwen, yes, you heard that right, too. Plains tribes such as the Comanches and Kiowas had terrorized their more advanced in terms of American culture new neighbors, as we illustrate in Chapter 4, the Trail of Tears chapter of the Oklahomans, Volume 1. Now, there was another big reason for the tribes siding with the Confederates. That was the latter's stunning battlefield successes during the early days of the war in the summer and fall of 1861. This included in the East, where a socially awkward college professor named Tom Jackson decided not to retreat his Confederate forces from a hill during a battle the North was winning near Bull Run Creek and the Virginia town of Manassas, but rather to stand and fight. And thus was born the name and legend of Stonewall Jackson. And thus did the South stun the entire world by routing the United States Army all the way to the gates of Washington and turning a likely 90-day war into a gargantuan four-year one. And thus did the natives of future Oklahoma, especially after they heard the Confederates had similarly shocked the Federal Army in the Western Theater of the New War at the Battle of Wilson's Creek, Missouri, and that's just 50 miles or so up modern-day Interstate 44 from Oklahoma, 
And the tribes begin to think, hey, we might be backing a winner in this war if we go with the South. They might actually win. So, Gwen, I guess our golden nugget this go-round is that next time on part three of the Civil War in Indian Territory, we'll explore just what happened in modern-day Oklahoma during that conflict. And here's a clue. It was a lot. Who knew Stonewall Jackson was really Tom? He lived 37 of his 39 years of life as Tom Jackson, and he had other less complimentary epithets or monikers such as Fool Tom, Old Blue Light. It was only the last two years of his life that he was even known as Stonewall. And I've never heard of Albert Pike. Now, he must have been quite the negotiator. He must have been going out to all these different groups, the Comanches and all, and sitting down with them. and, And persuading them to go with the Confederacy. But then the Confederacy honored the Indians with those promises. Did those promises continue? Oh, that will have to be answered in the next part of the Civil War and Indian Territory. Now that's Oklahoma Gold.